Okay, looks good. So you're recording and ready for me to begin. Yes. Uh, I'm going just, I got a lot of pictures on the side here. I'm going to try to. Uh... There we go. Okay. Um, you heard the title where I call it good news. Uh, good news because you're not seeing a lot of birds, kind of like the house sparrow and the starling. We'll tell you about the other birds that could have been another house sparrow or another starling all the time. This is the failed introductions primarily of European songbirds. Yeah, let's see, here we go. I'm going to cover uh, generally six cities wow. that had organized releases uh, when I mean organized, there was some sort of society. This is not a lone individual that went off with a, uh, a, a mission of his own, although certainly there were missions involved as this works out, but it required quite a bit of financing. And so it did require society. And this happened within six and maybe a little more cities with, across North America. Um, primarily, they were introducing German and English uh, backyard birds. Of course, these are European birds, but it turns out the German uh, immigrants and English immigrants uh, seem to be the spearheads of this. There was very little Italian or Spanish or Scandinavian involvement. And they were being introduced simply for beauty, simply for their song, simply to remind them of the old country. Uh, and as I go through this, there are some local connections to Dutchess County that I will, will end up mentioning. Um, this is where I started with my information. This is a good index. This was published in 1928 um, by, the, interestingly, the Department of Agriculture. And uh, it's available online as a digital copy. And it tells, just as the title explains, wild birds introduced and transplanted to North America. However, the real information comes from online newspapers. Um, newspapers were, were, they published everything in those days. And it's amazing what you can find. And we'll, I'll, I'll share some of the newspaper clippings as I go through this. That's where the, my source is. And to start off, I say names first and then the birds came. As, as you know, our robin, we call it an American robin to distinguish it from a European robin to which it is not at all related. Um, it may look the same in the sense of a red breast, but it really doesn't even look the same. In fact, just to back up here, that upper right bird is the European robin. Oh, no. The middle one we'll talk about later, um, but that's a thrush, that's their black bird, but it's actually a thrush. We'll go into those momentarily. But these names here, are names that the colonists brought with them and assigned to our birds just because it reminded them of the old country. And these are the 12 birds in particular that I will be uh, talking about, 12 European species. The number is how many different cities in North America released these birds attempting to at least, uh, they may have released them multiple times, some three or more times but most were one or, or occasionally two. Um, but this is the number of cities that released these birds. And this is some more which were only released once, these, at least that we know of. Uh, there might have been exceptions of some individual that uh, tried to do something, but it never got far. But these are ones that those cities released just in one city. Uh, and these are the cities, which is somewhat interesting. You'll notice the Northeast is very well represented, and then the West Coast. Um, the South, no one in the South was interested in releasing birds. Um, can't say no one, but um, surely they were into agriculture, into the, the cotton and whatever else. And of course, Florida was not what we think of Florida now. It was not a retirement state. It was a, a swamp, I guess we'll call it. Uh, so this is back, we're, we're looking primarily between the Civil War and the First World War. Um, but these are where the immigrants came from or, or settled once they had came across. And I got to, uh, this is the exception. So I'm going to talk about this one first, to kind of get it out of the way. 
Um, the house sparrow was introduced to control insects. Uh, it didn't do a good job of that, uh, but initially that was the reason, and that was also felt to be successful. And I'll, I'll show you another picture in a moment, which is what I really wanted to show, uh, but it was very popular. This had a lot of support by the, the cities involved. And as it turned out, uh, over 100 cities in the United States and in Canada are documented as actually releasing house sparrows in order to eat insects and just make for a, a better city. This Eugene Shifflin, I will talk about him a couple more times. He was a little, um, he was very interesting. Uh, and the one thing he did different from others is he would release birds in the same location multiple years in a row. And in this particular case, he released house sparrows in 1860, 1861, 1862, and 1863 in Madison Square Park of New York City. And uh, there were, there's documentation, but it is so skimpy of this fellow, Alfred Hasbrook, that he was a doctor at Vassar Brothers Hospital, quite prominent. And um, I don't know that he released them, but he had documented that house sparrows were released in Poughkeepsie. And that's about all I know. Uh, I'd love to know more. I've just never been able to find anything. This is the other picture I wanted to show. Um, this is Madison Square Park in New York City and Union Square Park in New York City. And those very elaborate houses were built to encourage the house sparrow to settle in. Um, a fellow named Alfred Edwards was responsible for building those. And the people around the parks um, fed the sparrows, put water out for them. It was very much a community effort. And I think that part does carry over to all these other places where there were introductions. It was something that was supported, something that they thought was making a better world. So we'll start first with New York City uh, because it was the first one. Um, the Brooklyn Historic Natural History Society uh, in Brooklyn was uh, the spearhead for the early releases, a number of dates there. There were also individuals that did get involved and Skylarks were one of those. I'll talk about that a little bit more. And then we get at the, at the bottom of my slide here, the American Acclimatization, I have trouble with that word, society. They were started in 1871 with Eugene Shefflin, again, the same guy I mentioned on the previous foil about house sparrows. He was their president. And this, this organization existed throughout the 1870s and then it just kind of faded away. But they did many releases. Um, they also did a game bird release. I meant to say that a little earlier. We're only talking about songbirds because that's what was released in the cities to make life better. There were many game bird releases and that was done not in the city but over in hunting preserves of one type or another for hunting purposes. And I will not really be mentioning game birds tonight. Uh, my last thing on Eugene here is after the, uh, that society kind of went away, he continued to release birds. We'll talk again about one of his later. Uh, these are the two uh, European goldfinch and the skylark, again, European. Uh, these were very prominent, released in multiple locations. Uh, you can see why with the goldfinch, quite colorful. The skylark, uh, it's, a, it's a singing bird and it, it likes fields. Uh, and it has quite a display it makes when it, it flushes up from the ground up into the air, it's almost like a, a bobolink in that it uh, flutters and, and sings uh, quite a song. Within New York City, this is a, still a New York City slide, uh, they, issued, they released at least 10 different species, roughly 20 pair each. You'll see as I go through this, the number 20 or thereabouts and 100 uh, were the common um, release points or, or number of birds released. Um, the goldfinch and the skylark, also the chaffinch, stayed a few years. You might call the releases successful, but in the sense of uh, starlings, they weren't that kind of, uh, of success. But of course, starlings were released by uh, our friend Eugene there. And uh, they, they say he uh, 
wanted to have all the birds of Shakespeare. That's a myth. Um, other people before me have looked to uh, prove or disprove that. And it's apparently sometime around 1947 or in the, in the late 40s is the earliest reference that can be found to that myth starting. So we're gonna call that a myth. Um, this is interesting. This is a, uh, I'll call it a newspaper ad. Uh, Forest and Stream was a weekly magazine on newsprint uh, kind of looked like a uh, uh, the New York Daily News or whatever. It was a, a newspaper type magazine. And this ad ran every week throughout 1882 uh, and other ads other years. The part, that, and they were bird dealers. And you can see, uh, well, you'll find it to your, their, your advantage to call um, for assortment of song and fancy birds of all kinds. But at the bottom, this is what amazes me. We will buy live Rocky Mountain sheep, beavers, antelope, wolverines. I mean, how many people keep Rocky Mountain sheep in their backyard that would be selling to these people? <laughs> or would they be going out west and trying to catch them live and bring them back on a train? I, I, it's hard to imagine how many of these they bought, but whooping cranes, prairie chickens, um, quails might be Bob White and wood ducks, wild turkeys. Uh, I find that ad interesting to run over and over. Now we'll jump to St. Louis, 1870. Um, here is one exception of, there was not a real formal society, but we got this guy, uh, Klein Schmidt, and he financed this effort. And uh, looking at my notes here. No, it's the next guy. Okay, we'll talk about, uh, I don't know how much Klein Schmidt spent on this. I do know the next fellow I'll talk about. But this Kyle Denzer, he was the one that, that actually physically released the birds. And they brought six different species over from Germany and released them on April 25th of 1870. And that was basically it. This is what I call, they brought over lots of birds, released it, they disappeared. And that's sort of the end of the story. Uh, Greenfinch is a nice common European bird you'll find in your backyard. But Siskin, um, these kind of look like our pine Siskins. They're certainly related to them in the same family. Um, but it's a lot more yellow. That's a, a fair picture of it. Um, and as I say, these birds disappeared, which was the normal thing with an exception. And the exception was the tree sparrow. St. Louis is the only city that released tree sparrows. Um, there was a suggestion, and I don't know that it's uh, true or false, but you can see this kind of looks like a uh, house sparrow. And it was said at the time that there was a uh, mistake made and the people sent over tree sparrows instead of house sparrows because house sparrows as particularly in 1870. 1870 was, was prime time for releasing house sparrows. Um, but they released tree sparrows, and only 20, but they settled around a brewery. Now, I don't know if this was Anheuser-Busch or who was uh, the brewery in, uh, in St. Louis, but certainly they had a lot of grain associated with the brewery. And uh, tree sparrows settled in. And in fact, they're there to this day um, primarily in East St. Louis and North of St. Louis, and even as far as Iowa. Um, and they're quite easy to see. I would recommend anybody that's driving through in the interstate, uh, check eBird because it's very easy to find these. There's a, there's a park in East St. Louis that uh, they're quite, quite common. Now we jump to another one, Cincinnati. Uh, this one, they started uh, another one of these societies for the acclimatization of birds except that didn't last very long. This fellow whose picture I'm showing, uh, Andrew Erkenbrecker, uh, he was the guy that financed this and he started the Cincinnati Zoo. And that first organization in 1872 became the Cincinnati Zoo. So he started a second society primarily to release birds. And here's the one I have, have uh, expenses on. It, they released them for two different years and he spent over $9,000 bringing birds over uh, from Europe and releasing them. Now, $9,000 today, I think, is a, is a fair amount of change. But $9,000 in the 1870s 
that, that was quite a, a commitment to trying to establish birds. Uh, and here are a couple that were released in uh, uh, Cincinnati. And again, these are singing birds. These are trying to uh, improve on the uh, um, North American singing birds. It's interesting. Uh, I, I read in researching this, uh, one fellow felt that there were a lot of American singing birds, as we ourselves know when we go out birding. Um, but that for some reason, people weren't paying attention to them. And they thought they remembered their European ones as being better. And uh, so songbirds were definitely singing songbirds brought over. Again, this fellow that spent the $9,000, they released 20 different species, generally 100 pair each. I have some more specific numbers. A lot of these died on the way over. And uh, of this 100 pair, I don't know if that's the starting number or the ending number. I think it's probably the number they ordered and uh, a number of those died. Again, notice it comes from Germany. Germany and England were far and away the locations that these birds came from. They were released in the spring, which was very common. That was felt, I guess they would start nesting was probably the theory behind it. Uh, and occasionally a bird would be seen the next year, but like the others, they disappeared. Um, Portland, this is Portland, Oregon. Um, I love this name, a society for the introduction of useful songbirds into Oregon. That's quite a name. And they went with that name for nearly 20 years and then they renamed it to the Portland Songbird Club. And this one is a little different. This guy Fluger, Christian Fluger was, um, he's a German fellow. And he was very dedicated to this. There was not a single person who financed it. The guy Fluger with these clubs uh, or the single club collected donations and he was very successful at it. Um, these are a couple of the birds that, uh, again, these have been released as you from the, from the beginning in multiple cities, but I chose to associate them here. That bullfinch is quite a uh, handsome fellow um, and a woodlark as well there. 13 different species were released generally 10 to 20 pair, released over three different years. Um, goldfinch, they released starlings again. Uh, they were released in multiple locations, but didn't stick in those other locations. Um, but they did stay around for a couple of years, as did the goldfinch in New York City, as did the skylarks. But they again, uh, ultimately disappeared. And a note on the bottom there, in 1895, they released 40 pair of mockingbirds. Now, the mockingbird is not a European mockingbird. This is the Eastern mockingbird, more specifically what we call the Northern mockingbird, but uh, the West Coast does not have mockingbirds. And some of the people on the West Coast undoubtedly had lived on the East Coast and decided that they missed their mockingbird. Uh, and you'll see in just a moment, the Cardinal had the same fate. They tried releasing Cardinals as well. And here we go, San Jose, California. Um, we have another acclimatization society. Um, they exchanged California quail, that uh, would be for hunting purposes with New Zealand. I'll talk about New Zealand again coming up too. Uh, in exchange, 60 mm. California quail for 150 skylarks. Now those are European skylarks that were introduced in New Zealand and I'll talk about that later. They released these. And that picture down at the bottom, that is the uh, Alum Rock Park, a park in the uh, outskirts of San Jose with a aviary. Um, it's interesting what they did to release birds in general. This applies all across the North America. A few places built aviaries, but probably none as elaborate as this one. Um, the Brooklyn that I talked about at the very beginning, the uh, History Society, Natural History Society, they kept their birds uh, in a building, in a room, and they just flew around the room all winter to be released the next spring. Um, other ones just got them and released them literally the next day, but they were trying to uh, acclimate them to the climate and uh, different people tried different things. And this uh, San Jose outfit uh, was also planning to release cardinals. And it turns out that's uh, uh, still a problem today. Uh, cardinals from Mexico, uh, what we call the Northern Cardinal, 
are, are kept as cage birds. And a number of those are brought across into Southern California and released. And uh, I just noticed the ABA allows you to count cardinals in Los Angeles uh, as a released bird that's uh, established uh, there. Victoria, this is British Columbia. Um, this one was again a natural history society and they audited 500 birds of which only 200 survived the journey mm -hmm. over. I'll describe the journey in a moment. Uh, they were released in November, 100 in Victoria. That's on the Southern end of uh, Vancouver Island off the West coast of British Columbia. And another 100 in December in the same year in the city of Vancouver on the mainland. Uh, this is the only place I found where releases were done in the fall or early winter, but late in the year. Uh, that was an exception. Um, these skylarks, by the way, this is the one place they took a little bit. Uh, you can see skylarks today uh, on the north side of Victoria on the, on the road towards the airport. There are some fields. They're hard to find, but they're there. Um, look on eBird and uh, you'll find a few skylarks from this introduction are still present. Uh, a couple more birds that were released by uh, Victoria. Um, talked about them ordering 500 before. Here's another 500 for 1,000 birds, five different species, but only 49 survived to be released in April, not in the winter this time. Uh, and as I just mentioned, the, uh, the skylarks did somewhat become established. This is one of those newspaper clippings. Um, this is a fellow, not the greatest clipping from a, a microfilm digitized uh, newspaper, but it shows you how the birds were, uh, were handled. Now this guy, I'm not sure if it was this personal guy, but uh, went over to London. And in London, England, they, uh, again, this is British Columbia, they weren't Germans, these are the English. And so anyway, they went over to England and acquired these 500 birds in the fall. They were kept all winter. And in March, they were taken to Liverpool, which was the normal uh, leaving point for the steamships coming to uh, across the Atlantic. I don't know if they landed in, um, landed as a ship, not by an airplane, in New York or Boston or maybe Halifax, but they were then put on a train. And this newspaper clipping uh, was following. You could see for multiple days in a row, they would say, the birds have made it to Montreal. The birds are going through the prairie provinces. The birds will be here tomorrow. And they had this picture of these small little cages of which the birds were being fed. So you can see not 500 clearly would survive or even if they were destined for New York, there was quite a loss. Uh, the last city I'm going to talk about is Detroit. And 1913, now to me, that's getting kind of recent. Uh, I know it's 100 years ago, but uh, we started out in the 1840s. And this is releases continuing. And this is by Henry Ford. And Henry Ford is exactly who you think he is. That's the, uh, the fellow that built the car. And he had a farm called an estate here in De Dearborn, just outside of Detroit, and he was quite a bird fancier. And he audited 500 songbirds from England. Uh, and his estate, uh, he had many, many bird houses, feeders, and he even had a heated bird bath and some heated fountains for uh, drinking. Uh, maybe fountains is too strong a word, but uh, he had water out for the birds heated. In 1913, there probably wasn't a lot of electricity around then, but that, I don't know if that's what he used. I assume he did. But this newspaper clipping, the last paragraph is the one I find interesting. It is expected these birds will increase rapidly in numbers and eventually spread over the entire state. Um, and again, you can see this is supported. This is, uh, no one is decrying why were this being done. We're going to have problems like and they were, there was a lot of concern, especially by 1913, that the house sparrow was not a good bird. Um, but they were still supporting more releases. 
Uh, these are a couple of the birds that uh, our friend Henry Ford released, the chaffinch, and as they say, the blackbirds are thrush, quite common over there, bobbing along the lawn. And these are the numbers. Um, he audited, going back here, he audited 500 European songbirds, of which 196 survived to be released in April. And there's the count of the actual number of birds that survived of the variety of species that he attempted to release. Okay, that's it for the cities. Now, uh, the good news that I titled this, this program, I just wanted to list some of the birds that are actually established in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, why Australia and New Zealand is because like North America, that was new territory. And like North America, the English uh, had a lot to do with the settling of Australia and New Zealand. And the English brought birds with them, or at least ultimately. And uh, so the skylark again, the goldfinch, starlings are in us, both Australia and New Zealand. Uh, Greenfinch, blackbirds, you can read the list, house sparrows again there. Uh, and a few in New Zealand only, and, and our friend the tree sparrow from St. Louis is, uh, is established in Australia as well. And there are some other non-European birds that were added to their list. But this is why, again, I call it uh, good news that you're not finding all these birds in your backyard. You might like to see them once or twice, but I don't think you want these to be uh, taken over for our North American birds. And one story on dear old Hawaii. If you've been to Hawaii, the odds are, especially if you've been to Honolulu and Waikiki or something, um, the odds are you did not see a Hawaiian bird. Uh, if you want to see Hawaiian birds, you have to go into the uh, forests and up the mountain slopes and, and away from people. Where people are, are uh, released birds. They have released 160 species at one time or another. And this 51 established, that is a number this year that are recognized from the ABA as countable. They're, they're established reproducing. Um, they're not all songbirds and they're not all European, but it just shows you how things can go wild. Uh, that map I showed at the very beginning of the United States where I said uh, the South wasn't uh, releasing much. It's interesting with what's happened in Hawaii. Um, had Florida uh, been more uh, a retirement community, if I could call it that. Uh, it's interesting to think that some of these birds could have been released there and might well have become established. And if you've been to Florida lately and, and looking for birds, uh, purple swamp hen and uh, some minor birds and a few others, uh, they're getting their, their birds, their par parrots are pretty common. Um, and I wanted to say one thing about expansion. I, I show a picture here of a house finch, which is not European, but these two birds are the two exceptions. Uh, they expanded. Remember, I mentioned there's a couple tree sparrows still in uh, St. Louis. There's a skylark still to be found in Victoria, um, but they did not expand. It, for some strange reason, um, where the birds became established, they just did not expand with the exceptions here. And, and to bring it back to Dutchess County, um, Newburgh did, is documented as, as having starlings in 1905, but our friend Menzel Crosby uh, documented on October 24th, 1909 was the uh, first documented starling in Dutchess County. And similarly for house finches, we have also in Rhinebeck, but not by Crosby, he had passed away by this time, but uh, July 14th, 1956 is when the house finches that were released in 1940 on Long Island uh, were first seen in Dutchess County. And here's our friend, Eugene Shefflin. Um, a few of you may think you know the name from the things I have written in the past or things you've just learned on your own, but uh, Shefflin is the middle name of uh, Manzel Crosby, Manzel S. Crosby. Uh, this was his great uncle. Um, Eugene's brother, uh, who died in 1890, uh, so he did not, he, his brother never moved to Rhinebeck, uh, but his sister-in-law did. And uh, she's the uh, grandmother of uh, uh, 
Menzel Crosby, and uh, they released lived in, in Rhinebeck. And this guy, Eugene, he would summer in Tivoli and uh, got together with his uh, sister-in-law. And at Grasmere, they released 35 Skylarks in 1895. And then the next year, again at Grasmere, they released 130. Uh, but they did not come back in 1897 to, to release any more. Um, there is one record that uh, uh, Burroughs, John Burroughs claims to have seen a Skylark across the river. Whether it came from this release, we don't know, but they, they disappeared. Um, I, this is another diversion to game birds. Um, Tracy Dow. Now, Tracy Dow was the next door neighbor of uh, Manzel Crosby, and he lived at what we now call Southlands, uh, Statsburg area. And he raised gray partridges. And that picture on the left is his pen in which he was raising gray partridges, not a great picture on the bottom. There are uh, four or five gray partridges down there. And he had this very elaborate uh, bird feeder set up to uh, feed pheasants and partridge in the wintertime. But he tried releasing uh, gray partridges to establish them in the uh, Dutchess County area. And um, they weren't successful, but uh, that was done. And the last page I wanted to show here is uh, those of you who, uh, who follow some of these odd, uh, casual, accidental records that show up. Uh, there was a brambling back in uh, March of 1984 in Pleasant Valley at a, at a feeder. And it stayed around for about a week, I think. Uh, the people whose feeder it was did not want visitors. And they allowed three or four or five club members to go over. And Oat Waterman uh, was able to get this picture of the brambling. Uh, there are very few records for North America, uh, fewer still for New York, but there are other records. Um, but this is the only Dutchess County record. And this is a guy that we don't believe was released. Uh, it was speculated that there were a number of bramblings in 1984 found uh, on the Western side of North America from Siberia. And they thought this guy might've come all the way from Siberia and found his way to Dutchess County. And the one at the bottom, there's their friend, the colorful uh, European goldfinch. And um, uh, Ron Gonzalez, is that his name here? Yes, Rod. Rod Gonzalez in Stomville. He's not a club member. Um, but he uh, took this picture of a European goldfinch at his feeder in uh, April 2015. It probably was a released cage bird. Um, it, they're seen fairly frequently around New York City, but the, the last official record of a established European goldfinch in the New York City area was in 1955. And um, so the odds are this is uh, an escapee or released uh, bird. So having uh, rushed through all that there without questions, I say thank you, and um, I guess I will end this and then take questions. I'm going to go back to uh, seeing all of you. <laughs> no, I'm not quite sure. How do I? Uh, yes, yeah, stop sharing. That's we'll click. There we go. So, are there any questions, comments, anything? Yes, Stan, it's Ken. Yes, hi, and Ken. You, you talked a lot about the importing of birds in the 1860s, 1870s areas. We have to realize there were no planes. Those birds all had to come over by boat. There was no absolutely. other way for them to get to this country. And so that's where a lot died. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And to bring those numbers and to try to keep them alive and comfortable and warm enough so not to die from the environment. Was yeah, that's challenge. why I think the, the fellow in, um, they spent the $9,000, I guess that was the Cincinnati fellow. Um, they had to send people over to Europe to acquire the birds and then, uh, you know, book passage and uh, 
maintain the birds and then deliver them, whether it be Cincinnati or St. Louis or, or Victoria, British Columbia. Um, it took some doing and it took some money. It took some commitment and support. Stan, why did, when do you think it started to dawn on people that maybe this wasn't a great idea? That's an interesting question. Um, house sparrows were certainly disliked by the 1880s. Um, I don't know how, how early it was really realized that, that house sparrows were not eating the quote unquote bad insects uh, that they thought they were going to control. Um, those parks in New York City that they were, were released at, um, there were worms, inchworms, or I don't know the, the uh, scientific names of these, but uh, they were eating the, the leaves of the trees around the park and then falling on people's head that were walking on the sidewalks or walking <laughs> through the park. And I must say, uh, one time when we were out in Arizona for the winter and then it get, became spring, we were over at uh, uh, Sara Vista and the uh, San Pedro house, uh, if that means anything to anybody that's been out there. Um, we went by at a time when these uh, caterpillars were just falling from the trees and it was quite disconcerting to walk around with these caterpillars constantly falling on you. Uh, they didn't do anything, but uh, I don't think many of us like that. And that was the case in New York City with the trees in these public parks. And they thought the house sparrows controlled it. So um, in 19, I don't remember the year, it was 1910, 1912 timeframe, uh, Alan Frost, Alan Frost uh, was Crosby's sidekick, and he became curator of the Vassar Brothers Institute Museum. Uh, he put a uh, editorial or a uh, letter to the editor into the uh, Poughkeepsie Eagle newspaper, uh, trying to get people to kill house sparrows. So certainly at that time, and you know, this is a quite a dedicated birder. And he was uh, trying to spearhead an effort in Poughkeepsie to kill house sparrows. Uh, Menzel Crosby himself had a lot of house sparrows in his barn. He's the one that, if you, those of you that went, we, we had the walk there a couple of years ago in that big stone barn where uh, yeah. Clinton's yeah. daughter got married. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had a lot of house sparrows there and he regularly shot them. Uh, that's, he, he documented that happily. Do you think he was aware that they were um, competing with, you know, bluebirds and uh, other North American birds? I don't know about bluebirds, but he certainly felt they were competing and not adding value. Uh, that's uh -huh. for sure. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Hey, Stan, Anybody? I didn't see uh, anything about warblers, and they're, they're my favorites. And among the most colorful and the prettiest singers were they prominent in Europe back then? And I would think immigrants would love to bring them over here. Yes, um, they're, we're talking about two different types of wobblers. The, the one that we think of in North America that we generally refer to as the family of wood wobblers, uh, that is purely a North and South American uh, family. Okay. Uh, Europe and the rest of the world does not have the wood wobblers. However, they do have a family called wobblers uh, that are small, um, some more colorful than others, but it, predominantly they're not a, uh, a, a very brightly colored family. Um, and I would say those were not your backyard bird. Uh, you may find them in trees around your, your home, especially on the countryside, but it, like here in, in North America, uh, most non-birders are unaware of wobblers. They, they just don't come to their feeder regularly. They don't see them when they go out of the house. Not a blue jay. Uh, it's a bird is bird. Yeah. Somebody else. Yeah, I have a, I have a question. <clears throat> so all the introductions you talked about were from private citizens. I know, I know for plants in the late 1800s, the USDA had a whole division whose responsibility was to go out around the world and find plants to bring back to the country. So I wondered, was there any government sponsored uh, introduction of birds? Did the USDA do that? Um, good question. 
Um, I forgot to mention one thing when I was talking about San Jose, California. There were two other societies in California. One specialized in introducing plants and the other specialized in introducing fish. And um, I don't know if any of you are, are diehard fishermen, but uh, I'm not. But uh, as I understand it, it is quite uh, regular, common to have the inappropriate species of fish released into the wrong place. And then it does a lot of damage by competing, out competing uh, native fish. Um, of course, we have invasive plants that have, have taken over. As to whether the government supported this, they certainly were not against it. Um, the, the laws pretty much started around the late teens and the 1920s. Um, there were hunting uh, attempts to control hunting of birds in general. Anybody could go out and shoot any bird they wanted to mm -hmm. into the 1880s. And the laws were quite ineffective. They weren't enforced, they weren't followed. And uh, the first thing that happened, I don't remember the year, I'll say 1904, somewhere around there. Uh, I think it was called the Lacey Act, and I may be wrong on that, but it had to do with uh, cross-border transportation of bird feathers. And uh, that was the first teeth that went into controlling the shooting of birds, uh, in this case for uh, uh, feathered hats. Uh, but it was really the uh, Migratory Bird Act of 1918. We've just passed the 100th year of it. And then Trump has tried to weaken it, but judges have, uh, have disallowed that. Mm -hmm. um, the government began acting in the 1880s and it just, it took until the 1920s to be real. Mm -hmm. As far as supporting it, I'm not aware of any support for bringing birds in. Can I say something? Angela Zimmett here. And my cat, who may or may not be in the picture, I can't tell. I have a fascinating book written by Frank Chapman in 1895, Birds of Eastern North America. And he does mention some of these birds as, you know, having been introduced. Um, European goldfinch, I just looked at, but it didn't seem to be very successful. But Sternus vulgaris, after several introductions that didn't work uh, oh. was introduced in New York's in Central Park in 1890 and about 60 birds seem to have succeeded in, in living there according to your friend Mr. Shefflin and all of these other birds I'm going to now look at but it's a, it's a fascinating book I quite often no, I quite often um, read it um, you know when, when, when things come up about birds that are new to well, I'm in Connecticut, sorry, birds that are new to Connecticut. And I find that they were living in Connecticut and New York back in 1895 as well. So they went and came back again, climate change. Yes, that's an excellent book. Um, it is. It, there were not a lot of introduced birds at that time, but the few that were in the East there, uh, Starling, he talks about 1890. Uh, I discovered while researching this because of the access to online newspapers, uh, our friend Eugene Shifflin actually released Starlings for three years. He started in 1889, and I can find that un not documented anywhere except in, uh, in the newspapers that I, I discovered. Um, but he's the one that was credited with releasing them in order to have uh, all the birds of Shakespeare. And as I say, that's a myth. We haven't been able to prove that that was his reasoning, and I don't believe it was. There are no myths like that in this. Um, unfortunately, it's just facts. Yes. Of, as in uh, Mr. Shefflin introduced them in 1890. But uh, no nice gossipy tidbits like that. I'd only heard the yes. Shakespeare version. <clears throat> Any more? Well, I would thank you for uh, attending, uh, Zooming here. And... Uh, I've enjoyed presenting. I hope you learned something. And uh, those are the birds you're not going to see tomorrow when you go out, go birding. <laughs> and uh, remind, 
a reminder to everyone that uh, within a couple of days, we will have this on the news section of the website. You don't need Zoom uh, just to see it on the website. Um, you'll just be able to look at it, okay? So um, just give us a couple of days and that'll be up there. Along with uh, the uh, previous programs we have done, um, one uh, gardening uh, for wildlife done by Sue Iannucci and another one uh, with a conversation with um, Scott Silver of Audubon. So um, uh, you get a chance to see all of them anytime you want, okay? And, uh, thank you. Thank you. Dave, 